Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 81 of the I Rock Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger, and I am I Rock Knits all over on the internets, and I Rock is just Corey spelled backwards, and I knit in a rocker recliner. Welcome to everyone today. I am recording a few days early. I've got a busy couple of um, next few days, and then I'm going to go up on a trip this weekend with my husband to drive up to northern Minnesota and pick up the fishing boat and drive back. And his brother was supposed to go and they were going to go fishing and now he can't. So I said, I'll ride along. <laughs> I can knit on the way up and on the way back. It's probably a four and a half, five hour drive. <clears throat> anyway, so I decided, well, I better get the podcast recorded or it won't get edited on Monday. Uh, so I thought I will just put it out there for all of you. Um, a bit of a health update. I did have an endoscopy last Friday and um, I, from what I can see in my, my chart, it everything came back as unremarkable. That's what it says. But my doctor has not called me. So they did two biopsies, one for H. pylori and uh, one for celiac. And then she did see inflammation um, in my duodenum, my esophagus, and my stomach lining. I think um, she put me on two new medications. <clears throat> So I started those on Friday night and um, they make me sleep. So Saturday morning I slept till 1030 and then I took a two hour nap in the afternoon. And I said to my husband, uh, I'm going to have to see. Um, I'm on it for 30 days, but it's I'm really having trouble kind of staying awake. <laughs> <coughs> and obviously that little cough is still there, um, but I'm willing to do it if it settles things down. Like if it is just GERD now that's left over from having C. diff, my stomach is still upset from that if it's inflamed because of that and we just need to get things calmed down or if there's literally a different diagnosis. I don't see her now for um, two, three weeks. Um, I do a follow-up with her, so I just kind of have to see if this new medication works. So anyway, there you go. That's my, my update. I want to thank you all for your well wishes. Um, in your prayers. Uh, it's been a long haul. I am feeling much better. I do have rough mornings. I, that might be the new normal for me to have an hour of discomfort uh, every morning and then I can function better. I would just like my energy levels to come back a bit. Um, they're just a little lower than normal for me. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that that comes back. Uh, I did uh, uh, Monday drive over to Stillwater, Minnesota um, late morning and met my friend Matt and my friend Sarah. And um, we had a little pastry and then we went over to Darned Anyway to the Madeline Tosh truck uh, van trunk show. So they Madeline Tosh now has a van that they drive around the country with their yarns and they're one of a kind yarns. And so they bring them into different shops. So on Saturday, they were at Stephen B and I was supposed to go and take my rhubarb scarf because that's made with Madeline Tosh. And it was my dad's 87th birthday. So Ross and I planned to drive to Sioux Falls on Friday night or Saturday morning and then drive back home. Like we were gonna do it in one day, kind of limit exposure um, and just see them. And then my mom called on Friday and said, dad's got a terrible cold. He's had it for several days. He's got a, he's just really congested. And then I talked to him and he sounded just nasal. And and I said, have you been around the grandkids? And he said, well, we had a little, you know, birthday gathering and the the young, the two, four younger ones they had seen, I think. Um, I always think it's kids carrying, you know, germs, but maybe not. Anyway, so we didn't go. And uh, so then I felt bad that I'd missed the Stephen B thing. So when Matt and Sarah asked if I could meet them, I was like, yeah, I'll, you know, it's about an hour across the city for me, but it was lovely to sit and have a little treat and then talk to two friends who you hadn't seen. Um, it was, and then the energy and the shop was so vibrant because people were so excited. They were grabbing up yarn and, um, you know, and as we were getting, I mean, we were there early. So as we were getting ready to leave, that shop seemed to be getting busier and busier and, People were sitting outside knitting and visiting, and yeah, it was it was totally a uplifter for me. 
I will show you what I purchased. I got this skein of Madeline Tosh, of course I did. And these are one of a kind, so there's no um, dye lot, there's no number on them. It means that like a mistake was made in the dyeing process or they decided to not go with that color that they were trying to start because it was too similar to something else. So they did have sweaters quantities of some of these um, in DK weight and fingering. They had a lot of single ply fingering and then they also had some pashmina. <clears throat> but I just went with one DK skein. I can always do something with a DK skein and I just thought it looked very autumnal. And then I grabbed a couple of skeins of Rasta. Malabrigo Rasta. This is like a raspberry, what is it actually called? This is a one of a kind magenta. Um, I was looking, I don't know, a week or two ago for some bulky in my stash and I didn't have any. I couldn't come up with anything that worked and I, so I had this little note in the back of my head, you should pick up some bulky. I like to make, you know, big cowls and hats and stuff maybe for Christmas gifts. Um, so those are the things that I purchased. Um, Matt and Sarah both got some yarn as well. I'll tell a little tale, tattle up tale on them. Uh, but it was, it was just really nice. I, I was back home by, oh gosh, I don't even know, 1, 2 o'clock, something like that. And my husband's like, you're home already? I said, well, you know, it's not a whole lot of time you can spend at a at a yarn store and not be in the way of other people. So yeah, it was, it was really nice. Let's talk about some audiobooks. Boy, have I been listening to books and I have a couple of really good ones. So the first one, I finished Harry's Trees. And it is by John Cohen. And I may have talked about that a bit last time. I really enjoyed it after a bit. At the beginning, I was like, I don't know. This is really quirky. Like, I like quirky characters. Um, but I just couldn't figure out where it was going. The guy is quite sad. Um, it starts kind of with a tragic incident. I would call this a bit of a lighthearted comedy romance, drama, story. Um, here, here's the premise. A grieving widower, a determined girl, a courageous librarian, and a mysterious book come together in an uplifting tale of love, loss, friendship, and redemption. 34-year-old Harry Crane works as an analyst for the U.S. Forest Service. When his wife dies suddenly, Harry, despairing, retreats north to lose himself in the remote woods of the endless mountains of Pennsylvania but fate intervenes in the form of a fiercely determined young girl named Oriana. She and her mother, Amanda, are struggling to pick up the pieces from their own tragic loss. Discovering Harry while roaming the forest, Oriana believes that he holds the key to writing her world. If I had read more of that and like thought about it before I started reading the book, I might have um, not been quite so confused at the beginning <laughs> because you you start out learning a backstory of two different people and when I was listening I, I think I was confused and it's really quirky it's very different it's it it lands a little bit on fantasy the book um, is a fantastical book uh, fantasy um, that you come to find out later is is grounded in truth um but it oh, really enjoyed it uh, enjoyed listening although i struggled in the first few hours to say am i gonna am i gonna like this or not like this so i would recommend it then i listened to feels like falling by christy hudson harvey and this was um really good i I guess people would call it chiclet, probably. I hate that term, but um, it was just a great story. Here, here's the premise. It's summertime on the North Carolina coast and the living is easy. Unless that is, you've just lost your mother to cancer, your sister to her extremist husband, and your husband to his executive assistant. Meet Gray Howard. Right when Gray could use a serious infusion of good karma in her life, she inadvertently gets a stranger, Diana Harrington, fired from her job at the local pharmacy. I loved Diana in this book. Diana Harrington's summer isn't off to the greatest start either. Hours before losing her job, she broke up with her boyfriend and moved out of their shared house with only a worn out Impala for a bed. Lucky for her, Gray has an empty guest house and a very guilty conscience. These two characters play off each other just wonderfully. The story was 
um, fun. It was an easy listen. It was a, a good read, lighthearted. Um, I really enjoyed it. I will look up other books by Christy Harvey to see if there are other things out there because I liked her writing style. Um, it was light, uh, quick read, but fun. Okay, and then I listened to The Duke and I by Julia Quinn, which is the first novel in the Bridgerton series. I did um, listen or watch the Bridgerton series when it came out and had not, never read the books. And I had apparently put them on hold because now they're coming up in my queue on Libby. Um, it was okay. I prefer to read a book before I see a movie. So I don't know if I will read the other books because I feel like I already know what happened. And that doesn't bother me so much in a quick moving movie if I've read the book, but the other way around, I don't love it. Tell me if it bothers you to know what's gonna happen. I, I just, I, I read it, it, it was okay. I was surprised that they chose to make it into a show, a television series from what I read. I was like, wow, this is, um, different. He is not the handsome, um, sweep you off your feet, low voiced romance hunk, um, in the book that he is in the movies. Um, at least the audio narration of him made him to be more of a duke with an accent and kind of a highbrow attitude than what I think they did with the television series, which I think was better. They still had the, the same relationship, but his voice and his um, words were, I don't know, just not as good as in the movie. So, and then I also read uh, Carry On Warrior by Glennon Doyle. So I kind of wanted to finish all of her books and um, that is based in um, a Christian, a bit of a Christian story and background you know she's a christian so i just want to put that out there um if if that's something that you enjoy listening to um but she has opinions on the bible and on christianity and um on where it comes from and how we interpret it um like i said she makes me think and then the last one i read was called moment maker and that's by Carlos Whitaker. And I had to get this one on Audible because uh, it wouldn't, I couldn't get it on Libby. Um, and I started following Carlos on Instagram a while back. And then I think the world started following Carlos when he helped raise money, that giant tip for the man at the Atlanta airport who plays the piano. You might have seen it on the news. It got carried by everyone. He was listening to this guy play away and he looked around and he felt like no one else was really listening. And so he went over and, and, and he said, he's got a tip jar on his piano. Let's raise some money. Then mow me money and I will give him a tip. And within minutes he had raised thousands of dollars carlos has a big following he is also a christian um he's a former christian rock band member and turned pastor turned now inspirational speaker um does a lot with um people of color talking about people of color and communities and um reconciliation and getting people on board he travels all over the country. His family is fun to, to watch. Um, but anyway, uh, I just thought, oh, he has a book. I didn't know he had a book. I, I should read his book. And this is kind of on the lines of a little bit of self-help, a little bit of self-reflection, a little bit of moving through the world, um, how to move through the world, how to make moments, how to make moments special, how to look around you and say, um, how can I make this a moment for people that is, you know, just a, in a good hearted way? Um, it was an easy read. I, um, I liked it. It's, it's an, a little bit older book. Let me see here. When did it come out? 
Okay, it came out in 2014 and it has four and a half stars on Amazon. I don't usually look at that, but I, I had to just Google when it came out. And uh, so, yeah, I would recommend that one too. I would say I, I really liked Harry's Trees and Feels Like Falling. And then the other three were good. So there you go, five, five books this week. I'm already on to my, my next one. I need to know from everyone if you guys have read Ducks, Newburyport. It is a 46 hour book and it is, I have it in my Libby app. It's up like, and so I downloaded it. Is this book worth 46 hours of listening time? Because I have, I have no idea. I don't know much about it. Someone must have recommended it at some point, but when it came out, I was shocked. So if you've read this and you watch this in the first couple days of it coming live, on Tuesday um, would you reach out and let me know yes Corey I read it and it was worth 46 hours of listening time um, I I don't want to put two or three hours into it and then decide oh this is you know not for me but I don't know I just like your opinion okay I have a shawl today and I didn't list I didn't lift it up I didn't put it on its stand so I'm just gonna pull it forward here a bit not too far because then you won't see the beautiful bottom. This is the most luxurious shawl I own. It is Westport and it is by Sarah Wilson. And uh, she's the sexy knitter if you follow her on Instagram. It came out in 12, 2012. I knit it much later than that. But this is my go to a wedding shawl. It is uh, silk and mohair and uh, superwash merino and it is um, shiny shinier than what you're seeing here i think and just drapey and lovely it was a beautiful shawl to knit um let me read you the instruction uh, the description moving into a neighborhood just west of Kansas city's upscale outdoor shopping center taught me a lot about street style Westport, a popular hangout for a group of people I would later call, know as hipsters, was a veritable treasure trove of zany characters. For the first time, I realized you could do more with a scarf than just throw it over your shoulder in the wintertime. My contribution is also a little offbeat. It is worked from tip to tip and is scattered with tiny textural circles and a wide lace border. It is a knit on a US 6. She used Claudia's hand-painted yarns. I used Hand Maiden Fine Yarn Maiden Hair two skeins in the orange colorway and it was 656 yards that I got in, at Stephen B's. Hand Maiden Yarn is lovely, expensive, and I had these two skeins. So you knit from the end here. So you start here and you're going back and forth this way. And then you get to make these little dots, which were super fun and really textural. And then you have this wide lace border, which if I remember right was charted. Yeah, and I had to write it out. I had to write out the repeats because I couldn't get them down. Then once I got them going, um, it was not difficult at all. But it is um, just lovely. That's about half of it. Here's the other half. So it's pretty good sized. Um, I, I just really love it. And I think one of the reasons that I love it the most is because of the yarn that I used. So it definitely can just wrap all the way around your shoulders. It goes down past my elbow. Um, so when I go to a wedding, um, I feel like this is the one to grab because it's, it's just uh, you can't you can't see how shiny it is it's, it's just lovely there's just a real shine to the yarn so that's the Westport shawl I did some knitting this week I am teaching a class at Knit and Escape and I needed to knit up some new samples I am teaching cabling without a cable needle and uh, I teach at the library a owl cowl in my Beyond Beginning knitting classes 
I used to before the library hasn't had classes in a year and a half. So here's the first cowl. And I showed this on my live with Christy. It's very 1970s. And the variegated yarn do not, you know, it doesn't show the, the owls very well. And it's cute. I like it. And I sewed all the different buttons on there. But I, I really felt like I needed one that was going to show off the owls for class. So I knit this one in some dream in color. And it takes you longer to sew on those buttons than it does to knit the cowl. <laughs> but I have all different, I have a big button jar collection. And so I just sorted through it and put all different buttons on the owls. So I knit, I got that cowl knit. And then I also did the hat because although I had a hat at one time, I don't know what happened to it. I must have gifted it to someone. And so there is a hat pattern too. So for the class I'm teaching, you can choose. You can do the hat or the, the cowl. And it's a great way to practice cabling without a cable needle because each owl has three cable crossings. So it's a two by two here, a two by two here, and a two by two here. But it's the same two by two the whole way. So you right cross and left cross. And so you just can get into a real rhythm. It's like knit eight, purl three, knit eight, purl three. And then you do the cable crosses. Um, it's a simple, easy way to learn how to do uh, cabling without a cable needle. Um, it's a, a four stitch cable you cross two by two. And it, you know, that's a pretty simple one to do. I like using a cable needle when I get up into like crossing four by fours or six by sixes. Um, I know that because I uh, I knit that. Oh, I knit that uh, Burberry cowl that has the big cable crosses in it. And I struggled to do that without a cable needle. It was just too many stitches crossing over. To, I think that's like a six by six. Um, but these smaller ones, it's so much easier. And so I did get um, a lot of knitting done. And then I cast on the hat in this colorway um, and got, I don't know, partway up the owl. But now I'm going to use that um, to use in class as my hands to, to knit when I show. Um, and then I'll finish it up. But I just thought, oh, I would show those. There are tons of owl patterns out on the Ravelry and the internet. There are owl blankets. There are owl sweaters. I've showed that on the podcast before. Kate Davies has an owl sweater and an owl cardigan. I've knit that a number of times for many people. Um, for friends and myself, um, it's knit on a Aran weight yarn, so it works up really fast. There are owl hats and cowls, many of which are free, some of them better written than others. Uh, but it's they're all based on this same three cable owl crosses. And they're kind of cute and fun, and especially this time of year. So I thought, well, I've got them laying here. One was drying. I will share it with you because maybe you're looking for something fun to cast on. Um, right now, I am sponsoring on the Pigskin Party Knit Along with Boston Jen of the Down Cellar Studio Podcast, a Learn Something New technique. I have a new pattern coming out later in October. And uh, there, it's a, there's a new technique in it. And so I wanted to have that be part of the Cal, but October and November were already taken. And so Jen asked me if I could do September and I said, sure. So I um, won't have that new technique idea in there because it, isn't being, <laughs> it hasn't been published yet. Uh, so we're just doing um, learn something new. And the suggestions that I made were doing Corey's two color cast on. Uh, because a lot of people still haven't tried that and it's super easy. I've talked about it on the podcast before. But um, learning how to do cables without a cable needle would also be a way to enter in that cow. And you have until October 1st, I think, to get extra points um, for the, it's called an interception, when each month you have a special thing that you can do to get more points um, toward prizes at the end and it's never too late to join if you go to the down cellar studio podcast and listen um to that or you go to the down cellar studio ravelry group and she's got a website so you can also look up at the information you just join you get put on a team you can knit anything you want every other 100 points 100 yards you knit you get points and so then there are incentives for you to um, do something with the designers who are sponsoring it, their patterns, the vendors who are doing 
yarn and stitch markers if you use their things you get extra points but you don't have to and it goes all the way through February so it's a huge knit along and it can be really motivating if you like working under like oh I get to cast this on and then if I get it done I can work on this next thing so that's kind of that's kind of fun okay I have a few things to share today I brought up this box I've been um, a little motivated to clean some stuff out so um, yesterday I did the junk drawer <laughs> which I took everything out and I threw away half of it do you all have a junk drawer do you sorry I'm bumping do you all have a junk junk drawer ours was in our kitchen and I just looked in it and it was full of like dust bunnies and you know thumbtacks and paper clips and just and nothing was sorted and there were there was you know 16 screwdrivers in there and two little flashlights and there that's not where they belong <laughs> it was just so I kind of did that and then I went into my bedroom and I was standing in my closet and I think I'm just in a mood I've been in my house too long um, I looked at my necklaces that are hanging on hooks in my closet I have this like jewelry rack thing and I don't wear necklaces very often. Um, I have a number of pretty ones, but I, I don't know. I just don't wear, I don't put them on very much. And I was looking at them, I'm like, they, there are some here that are decades old and you will never wear them. You need to just put them in a Ziploc baggie and give them to Goodwill or get rid of them or whatever. So I sorted and sorted and re rearranged and then I got a huge tangle. Um, so that <laughs> took a while, but today, this morning I was in my yarn closet in the office, which has also grown to be in a yarn closet in the hallway. Um, and I'd like it to be back in only in the office closet. But I was looking at the, I uh, was looking for uh, something and I found this box and I thought, oh, I'm going to share these. I don't think I've shared these before on the podcast. If I have, you're going to have to bear with me. But these are little Barbie clothes. And I was doing some reminiscing. So... Yeah, look at these little Barbie. I'm just gonna hold them up real short and sweet. They're all in a, in a little shoe box, little overalls, a little sweater, with a little matching skirt, another little skirt, uh, orange polyester fun fur, not fun fur, but novelty yarn, shiny gown. <laughs> Oh, wedding dress with a little pearl bead on it. There's a little horse in there. Oh, here's a hat that goes with this dress. Look at that little hat. Oh my gosh. Here's just a tube. Must be from her Barbie knitting machine. She had a Barbie knitting machine at one time. Um, here's a little sweater. Here's another little sweater. This one looks like it's a little too big for Barbie, but... Maybe she put it on another dolly or a bear and a dress and a poncho with a little fold down collar. Oh my gosh, so cute. These are just, here's a little skirt and a little top with a bee on it. Who, who took the time to make a bee, Corey? Like, what, you, you have time to knit this on your kid is two or whatever? Here's a little sweater. Little pair of pants. <laughs> it's just a whole box of memories. Do I remember making these? No. Do I remember this yarn? Yes, because I have a sweater. I have a hat, mittens, a hat and mittens out of this yarn. This is um, classic elite, maybe tapestry yarn. Oh, so funny. Oh, so look at that. Just a whole little stack of of cute Barbie clothes. Have you guys knit stuff for children and grandchildren? Most of my um, stuff came out of this Knits for Barbie book back in the day. And it was just easy to carry it out here and put it on the table. You guys know I just set stuff on the table that I'm going to talk about. So then I thought, well, I better run upstairs and grab the American Girl doll clothes that I knit when she got a little older, she, I think she got an American Girl doll. She had Kit. Kit looked like Kylie, um, the blonde bobbed hair, uh, Kylie always said. But look at this, like who, 
who would have knit this little jacket out of snowflake yarn? <laughs> and then there's a, a there's the skirt and there's a sweater and there's a hat, but I didn't find the sweater. Ross was working in the office and he was on a call and I'm back in the closet, not in the office, in the bonus room upstairs, the playroom, where there, her box of American Girl dolls and all their clothes are. And so I'm in there trying to, and I, I missed grabbing the sweater, but I do have a picture. And then here's a little sweater and Kylie had a matching sweater. This is cotton and she had a matching. <laughs> and then I put little buttons at the neckline. I I think Kylie's even had buttons. Like seriously? So cute. Oh my gosh. She's going to be, you know, 25. And I still have all this stuff. And then here was, I made these for her, um, her best friend uh, when she was growing up in our neighborhood was Jackie. And she and Jackie were inseparable almost from the time we moved here. She was the like first little girl we met. It, we moved here in uh, the beginning of October, end of September, and we went to a Halloween parade party down the at the park, and we met Jackie. This was inside out. I had to turn it, but this these were little coats, and they both had. And so Jackie's was blue with purple, and Kyla's was purple with blue. Look at that all seed stitch. So cute, poofy sleeves. So they're just all laying up there in her, you know, someday if she has children and has somebody who's interested in playing with dolls, then she will have. But I just thought I'll share those today because they brought fond memories for me. And um, yeah, Kylie is um, doing great. She is super busy with law school. She's involved in everything not unlike her mother, just, you know, sign up for all the things. And so she's got, um, she's the president of the Women's Lawyer Association on campus, and she's um, involved in several other groups. She's got, she's working for a professor, and she has an interview for a clerkship. So can I humble mama brag for a minute? We sh Everyone should think their childs are, you know, their children are wonderful not that they're not without fault we all know that right but um so kylie applied to be a clerk next year for the minnesota court of appeals and it's a pretty hard gig to get she was an intern it was called an externship this summer where she was uh assistant to the clerks for a judge and she loved it she really liked the judge she really liked being at the Judicial Center here in Minnesota, at the Capitol, by the Capitol, at, you know, in St. Paul. And she's not sure what kind of law she wants to study, uh, or not study, practice. And so she, being a clerk is a good way to get a bunch of different experiences in the court system to see what kind of law you might want to do. So she got this externship. She worked two days a week. And 3,200 people applied for this for these clerk positions. There are 32 positions because there are 16 judges. And each judge has two clerks. However, the clerks don't have to leave. Most of them, it's a one-year gig. But because the court was not in person this year, they're thinking that some of the clerks may stay for another year in the hopes that they would get to have an in-person court experience. So there may be fewer than 32 spots. And, um, because uh, Kylie got an interview, she got one of 40 interviews, and that is on Friday. So, um, you know, just super excited for her. She, she feels like her judge would hire her if her, if the, her clerks are leaving, but she's not sure if they're leaving. And um, she thinks that that, you know, she's got, great experience. She was on the journal. She got published. So she said, you know, with her background, she had a lot going for her, but so did 3,200 other people who apply from all over the U.S. to come to Minnesota to try to be a clerk. And so, oh, so nervous. She's so nervous. And it's a 15-minute interview with 12 judges. Rapid fire. You have 15 minutes to say something 
that they will like and remember. So, you know, she said, even if you do a good job, when you get done, you're not going to remember it. <laughs> and you're, you're going to think, I didn't say this, and I didn't say that, and it went so fast. So she's done practice round interviews, and anyway. So whether or not she gets it, we will all still, uh, you know, lift her up and love her on what at whatever path is meant for her. But boy, would that be exciting. Really, really fun uh, to have her. And, and to go through the process, she said, the whole process, the application process, and you know, um, you have to go through HR, and then you get a pair of people down, and um, there are three categories, and they don't always pick people who have all three categories. So anyway, all that to say, <laughs> Um, fingers crossed for Kylie and Friday, which will be past that by the time this goes live. Um, I have one Corey stories for all of you today, and that is part of my vacation story. I didn't, I included a lot of video on the last one. And as I was watching it back and inserting video, I was like, oh, Corey, this is getting incredibly long. People probably don't need to see your whole, you know, everything you did. Um, but just in case you're hearing it, we have a smoke detector going off. And Ross came out and said in an, in an hour he could get the ladder because I can't reach it. And um, so I have the door closed. But if you're hearing that little chirping, I know that it's going off. And um, he'll, be, <laughs> he'll be fixing it in a minute. Uh, but while we were on vacation in the Pacific Northwest, we drove down to what was called an arm, um, a piece of land that sticks out into the bay in Port Angeles and we drove down to the end because I still can't walk very well and it is probably a mile and a half down and back uh, down and then a mile, it would be a mile and a half back and stuff and so all it's bordered this road is bordered on both sides by water and then big rocks and it's like a, a retaining wall you know sea wall um, to keep the waters calm um, right there at the port. And then there was a naval center at the end of it. And uh, we got out of the car and we're walking and walking along the beach. And I want to find a piece of sea glass, right? Like that's my goal. I'm like, oh, if I could find a piece of sea glass, wouldn't that be fun to take home? So I'm walking and Ross is kind of skeeved out. It's not, it hasn't been cleaned up in a long time. Uh, the beach, right? It's um, full of seaweed and dead and, you know, very raw. <laughs> and I'm walking and we're not dressed to hike or whatever. And um, But as we were driving in, I saw this man who seemed to be feeding the cats. And I saw cats in different alcoves of these rocks and big driftwood trees. There were a couple big driftwood trees and there were some planted evergreen kind of trees along this route. And I said to us, I think that guy's feeding the cats. So I'm walking along the beach, I come back, we're getting ready to go, and sure enough, here's this guy holding a bag of chicken and a jar of cat treats. And I said, I said to my husband that I thought someone was feeding the cats, and he said, for 20 years, he has been feeding the cats along this road. And he feeds them in a certain place, and only those cats are allowed to eat in that place. And he puts out a little bit of the uh, good food first and then they come and then he puts the dry cat food out and they eat it and he comes in the morning and in the evening for 20 years and the vet van comes around and they pick up some of the cats and they check them for fleas and mites and illness and then they neuter some of them and so he said there used to be 60 and now there are like 30 cats that live on this long so while we were talking to him, I hit my phone. I, I recorded some of our conversation about what this whole thing was, which is some of what I just told you. But I'm going to play that here at the end because it, he was joyful about the fact that this was his mission um, he was an older man, seemed to be retired. And I said, you know, how many cats do you have at home? And he said, oh, I've taken home a few. And um, he, he was just really nice. He said he cooks, he goes to the store and he buys 10 pounds of chicken at a time and he cooks it up and then he brings it down. And I'm thinking, 
you know, there are just good loving people in the world that care about these animals and keeping them healthy. They all looked very healthy, like they weren't skin and bones. Um, and, and you know, they do provide services for any of them that get sick, like they, they watch for them and they round them up. And I don't know if he's the only one. Um, and my guess is not, but yeah, if he comes, if he comes twice a day and then you could see as we drove back out, there were several big flat rocks where he, that had like little overhangs of wood or green um, tree or something that he had put some food on. There would be like three cats on these rocks. It was just, it was really interesting. Fascinating. I don't know if you guys have ever seen anything like that, but I thought I would share. Standing up right up there. So 20 years you yeah. you come out yeah. here. Yeah. And, and we run the same route every morning, every afternoon. So they know when we'll be here and where. And they, all, they only eat at the... How did you know they were here? They like you just when, came upon them? Well, 35 years ago when we moved here, I would come out and there was over 60 out here. Way over. You could count 60. And... A rescue group came in, and then another group came in, and and uh, we got rid of the the county humane society because it was a kill organization. Yeah. We would take things in and kill them the next day. And I got rid of them. I got a new a new humane society, and the people were here again. And we feed birth control all summer. And, and uh, when they go off for spaying and neutering, yet all of those have clipped ears. There's one ear that's square. Uh, when they go off for spaying and neutering, they get all of their shots and they get tested for disease before they come back. Well, I think that's lovely. Yeah. We are dog people. We have a dog. We don't have cats. But as soon as I we came down, I saw... I said, I think he's feeding the cats there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he yeah. said, yeah, I suppose they live here. Yeah, it started just, just coming out, you know, healthy. Yeah, and, and they I, look super I buy, healthy. I buy 10-pound bags of chicken and boil the meat off the bone. And so they get their dessert first. Then they go and eat the food. But they get treats and they're just chicken and chicken fat. There's nothing, absolutely nothing yeah. else in it. It's all food grade. Yeah. And that keeps her hair nice and thick and shiny, and and uh, we work really hard at keeping them healthy. We, we pick up all the people food that's put out yeah. here. Yeah, we yeah. We don't, don't allow them to have people food. Yeah. And and so it, it it started as just an occasional feeding, and then it got more and more. And then when I retired. Uh, I just started coming out every day and then I started separating them because they were just everywhere, you know, yeah. they would just eat wherever, you know. Yeah. So we set up feeding stations and they got used to that and now they just stay right where, you know, they're there. They, they wander otherwise, but but they don't, they see, and I see there, there's cats under those trees right there. And I fed all along here and they're sitting over there watching me, but they won't come over until I come back. I go clear to the Coast Guard base and I come back and, and that's the there. last stop and they're sitting there waiting. Uh, you know, so it's, we don't pick up dead cats on the road anymore. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay, that's all I have for this time. I'm going to wrap it up. I've, I'm super busy with design work. I'm really far behind. Um, I had planned to have a sock collection come out in September for Socktober, and that just is not going to happen. We're going to push it back a little bit, and that's okay, right? It's just knitting. 
just design patterns, I kind of have to let go of the pressure and the stress of the fact that I wrote all these patterns and I was frantically knitting and trying to get caught up and it's just not going to happen and it's not going to make it and I already had commitments for two designs to come out in October and two de designs to come out in November. So I'm just going to have to flip those in and you can just be watching for those but if you haven't signed up for my newsletter um, on my website irockknits.com you can subscribe and every time I release a new pattern I put a coupon code out there for you to get it first for cheaper. Um, just as a thank you to being a loyal, faithful viewer and follower of the podcast. But until next time, keep it colorful. Keep your fork. Thanks for joining me each and every week and for your wonderful comments. I have not read commenters' names for several weeks now. I'm, I'm just feeling like it was too much to take on with not feeling well. And um, I will probably get back to that at some point. But I do read them and I have hearted everyone that I've read and I comment occasionally but not on every post anymore you know I've been doing that for over two years and it takes a bit of time and I just haven't really felt up to it if I can be on the computer I need I really need to be doing some work on the computer um, our days have gotten cooler and it's nice to see fall coming a little bit but uh, what else do I need to say here come in for your hug oh Big squeezes to everyone, especially if you're feeling alone or lonely, if you're feeling sad, if you have things going on in your life that are overwhelming. I see you. Buy the gravy. You'll never regret ripping out. See you next time.